Hi guys, welcome back. So I'm going to continue talking about stacks here. So the postfix example that we're looking at uses the stock .util, uh, Java .util .stack class, which has been part of the Java Collections API since Java 1.0. Um, it implements all the classic operations without any separate interfaces defined. Um, so there's not there's not a lot of consistency in how collections are implemented in the Java API, um, and we'll sort of look at the relative benefits of these things as we go. Other languages have a lot more consistent interface. For example, you know, the STL in Java or in, in C++ um, is, is much more consistent in how it operates. Uh, the Java, a lot of this stuff was just sort of tacked on until finally they said, ah, crap, let's, let's put in generics and let's do this, that, and the other. Um, so it's a, little, it's a little ugly, but, eh, well, there you go. <laughs> All right. So the postfix evaluator, here is the... Um, the, oh man, here's the diagram for it, the, the class diagram. So we have this Java util stack, um, and then this, um, this integer is a specialization of this or binding of the, the generic type to the, the generic. Um, then we have this postfix evaluator that uses the stack um, as part of it. And then we have this postfix texter that uses the postfix evaluator. Um, if you remember that your UML, um, it's interesting, I guess, but not particularly enlightening. Um, so one thing that you want to notice, if we go back and we look at this, you'll see that there is some nice um, asterisk, asterisk. There's some nice documentation in here. There's some really odd looking comments in here. You might look at this and go, why does this, why does this look like this? Um, and maybe you've seen this before. I really, I really don't know. But what this is, is uh, it's the Java doc style. So it's a documentation that's, designed to automatically generate documentation from the code. So we write them in a specific format and there's a tool that'll go through and pull the comments out and extract all the key information. Um, so it's used to create the online documents by a lot of, uh, a lot of classes. Um, the Java API documentation is generated this way and it is crap because of it. <laughs> no offense to people who love Java, but it's really kind of dodgy. Um, in any case, um, Javadoc is pretty useful. If you do it well, it can be really great. Um, the question is, did you do it well? Um, so the comments begin with slash asterisk, asterisk, and end with asterisk slash. Um, there are specific Javadoc tags that begin with at, and they're used to identify particular information. For example, at author, at version, at param, at return. Um, so we, you see, here's an example. We start the Javadoc comment. Um, there's the method description. Then we have the at param, um, and it's the name, and then what it's supposed to be, and then the at return value is what this function returns, um, and then that's the end. So we get the category, which is the category we're supposed to be matching, or the, get, getting the count of, I guess, um, and then we're supposed to return the number of uh, things that we counted that belong to that category. So this is the Java doc. Um, that's what it's supposed to do. Um, so you guys have seen exceptions. Um, I'm sure you've seen exceptions. I know you talked about them in 112, so we're not gonna go into them, but we're gonna use them a lot in this class. Um, so when should an exception be thrown from a collection class? So the only time that you really do this is when the problem is specific to the concept of the collection and not its implementation or its use. Um, so there's no need for the user of a collection to worry about getting uh, about it getting full. So we'll take care of all the limitations internally. Um, but a stack, for example, should throw an exception if the user attempts to pop an empty stack. So if you're doing something that violates the semantics of the stack or the way that it's supposed to be used, you should throw exceptions. But you generally shouldn't throw exceptions if you're implementing collections um, about things that you're really supposed to be taking care of inside of the class. Um, yeah. So although the API version of the stack did not rely on a, a formal interface, um, so when we write our own stack version, we're going to write an actual interface for it. So the, the, the API didn't have this, but we're, we're going to have this, right? So to distinguish them, our collection interface names will have ADT attached. So they're going to be abstract data type. Furthermore, our collection classes interfaces will be defined as part of a package called JSJF, and I'm sure you've seen packages in Java. 
Um, it's basically just a set of classes that do something common and you put them together into a package. Um, in any case, let's look at some examples here. So we have our package up here. We say, you look up at, up at the top, we say this is gonna be package uh, JSGF. Then we're gonna define an interface. Remember an interface is is like a promise of that you're gonna, of things, uh, a functionality that you're gonna provide, right? It's like, it's a set of functions that you're going to, it's only functions. You shouldn't, you don't have data in an interface, um, but it's a set of functions that uh, are things that you're, functionality that you're planning to provide. It's like a promise. And anyone that implements that interface should implement those. Now, how you implement them um, is up to you, but they should do what they're promising that they're gonna do. So here we're gonna have an interface. We're gonna say this is an interface, stack ADT, and it's a generic, right? So we have our reserved word interface, which means this is gonna be an interface. We have our interface name, and then we have a generic type parameter, and then we have a list of message signatures. So we don't have the implementations in here because remember, this is not an implementation. It's like a promise of a set of functionality that we're gonna provide. In this case, push, pop, peak, is empty, size, and then uh, we're gonna have this function that sends this, uh, returns the representation of the stack as a string. Now this is a little bit weird. Um, there are a lot of things that you can put in the stack that you couldn't represent as a string. So the fact that they put that in there means they, they plan to do something very specific with it. Um, it's a, it's really odd, but you know, go figure. Um, so we have our stack interface here and this is the UML diagram for, uh, an interface with a generic. Um, so we gonna, so in our case, we're going to implement our stack with an array. So we're going to explore our own implementation of a stack using an array as the underlying structure in which we'll store the stack elements. Um, we'll have to take into account the possibility that the array could become full. Remember with a stack, you aren't supposed to have to worry about the stack ever filling up, right? That was one of the things we talked about. We can't just throw an exception and say stack is full because that's, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to handle that internally and only throw exceptions related to stack operations, uh, abuse of stack functionality, right? Not internal implementation issues. Um, so remember that array of objects really stores uh, references to those objects, okay? So we have our array here, right? And it's an array of object references. So an array of objects is an array of object references and you have to actually allocate all the objects. You should know this from 112. Um, so when we wanna manage the capacity, so the number of cells in an array is called the capacity. So once you create an array in Java, you cannot change the capacity, okay? So if we want to expand the capacity to the stack, we'll have to create a new larger array and copy over the elements. Um, so this won't happen very frequently. Um, we're gonna allocate something that's big enough um, and the user of the stack doesn't have to worry about it happening, all right? So like a lot of cases, for example, one way that they do this, like in the in the C++ STL classes, when they have to um, reallocate memory like this, they'll double the size. So every time they do it, they'll double the size of the internal array. Um, so if you keep doing that, eventually you're not gonna have to worry about um, capacity or, or increasing the capacity anymore. Um, so this is how we're gonna manage the capacity. We're gonna allocate an array, and then if it turns out that the array is too small, we're gonna create a bigger array, and then we're gonna copy over all the elements. All right, so by convention, collection class names indicate the, uh, the underlying uh, structure. So we're gonna call this array stack. So array stack means it's an array um, and it's a, it's a stack that's implemented with an array. So again, java.util.stack is an exception to this because it's old and clunky and they changed the way that they did this a million times and it is what it is, right? Um, so our solution is going to keep the bottom of the stack fixed at index zero of the array. And we're going to have a separate integer called top that's going to indicate where the top of the stack is, as well as how many elements are currently in the stack. So the zeroth element is the bottom. So if the top is equal to zero, that means the stack is empty, right? If we push one on the stack, the top is going to become... Uh, probably one 
is the way that I would do it, right? Um, and so when you want to pop, so top would indicate that the next element to be filled in in the array, top indicates the next element of the uh, in the array to uh, to be filled in. Um, but it also indicates, um, so it's the next available slot. But it's nice to do it that way because if you do it that way, it can also count. So if I, and it also handles the zeroth case really easy, right? If the array is empty, top is zero. Um, that means there's nothing in the array and it tells us exactly where to slot this thing. Otherwise, if we tried to make top point to the actual top element, it would be a pain because we'd have to differentiate between top when it's empty and top when it's uh, at zero. I mean, maybe we could let it go down to negative one, but then we'd have to have a special case for keeping track of how many things are in there. If we do it this way, it's a little more elegant, right? All right, so we're gonna have, a, we have our stack with elements A, B, C, and D pushed on in that order. So we pushed A, we pushed B, we pushed C, we pushed D. Top is four. So top is the next one, the first empty one. Um, so remember the top of the stack is D, the bottom of the stack is A, okay? So we're filling it in from bottom to, to top. Um, so here is <clears throat> our code and what this is gonna be, again, it's gonna be an array implementation of a stack in which the bottom of the stack is fixed at index zero. So we have our public class array stack. Again, it's a generic implement stack ADT so the abstract data type, like I said before, the abstract data type is usually the, the, the pure version of the data type, which is separated from the implementation of the data type. So the stack ADT is the pure version of the data type. It's the stack conceptual, right? And then the array stack is an implementation of a stack that uses an array. We're going to see that there's other ways to implement stacks, better ways to implement stacks um, using other data structures. And we'll see that in the next chapter, actually. Um, so we're going to set the default capacity here to be 100. This is just going to be the default. Um, we're going to have a private. We're going to have the top. It's going to be a private int. We're going to have our array, which is going to be a stack. Um, <clears throat> we're going to set an empty stack. We're going to create an empty stack using the default capacity. Um, if you have a constructor, I, I don't know if you've seen this in, 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 in Java, but what we basically have here is we have two constructors. One of them takes a parameter and one of them doesn't take a parameter. Um, when you, we take the parameter, the capacity, we, we set the initial capacity for the stack. So maybe we have some idea of how big we think it's going to need to be. Um, we're going to allocate the array right here. It's going to be new objects um, of initial capacity. And this T here is going to be, um, so the type, the generic type for the stack is going to be here. So whatever type of stack this thing is, we're going to cast this to that type. And so remember references, it's okay to do this with because they don't, if you were a, not a Java person, you'd know that they're all pointers and they actually just are memory addresses. And so whatever they point to, they can point to anything. The size doesn't make any difference. So we can cast like this. Java hides this from me a little bit, but we're going to create an array of objects and we're going to set the initial capacity. The size of that array is going to be the initial capacity. And then we're going to cast it to this array type right here, right? Um, and we can do that, no problem. So what this constructor does is um, if they don't pass in an initial capacity, we're going to call the um, constructor that does take an initial capacity and we're going to pass in the default capacity. So we're really, we don't want to write the constructor twice because if we make a, a change to one of the code somewhere, then we're going to have to change two constructors and that's going to be a pain. It's a maintenance problem. So what we're going to do is instead, we're going to call the final constructor here. Um, Oh, we're going to call the constructor that takes a capacity, the one that, that's the good one that we want to use. And we're just going to, if they don't give us a capacity, we're going to have a default capacity. Um, again, I don't know how much of this stuff you've seen and you haven't seen, but this is a, this is a really common thing for people to do with constructors. Um, so you can't instantiate an array of a generic type directly. So what you instead you have to do is create an array of object references. Again, like I mentioned before, and you have to cast them to generic type. So an object reference 
all references are the same size in memory. They're just a pointer basically to the memory where the real object is, right? So I have the object, it has a memory address. Again, Java people probably aren't thinking like this, but I have an object that has a memory address. The reference is basically stores the memory address where that object lives, right? So the size of every reference is the same. The thing that's stored in the reference is not the same size, but the size of all the references is the same, so I can cast them to this type. So I do this in my stack. I say stack equals T, and I do this cast to the generic type, but what I actually allocate here is an array of object type. Remember, object is the base type for all objects in Java. Everything has an object type at the very bottom. Um, so we're gonna look at this. So we're gonna add the specified element to the top of the stack and expand this array if it's necessary. Um, so here we have our push. Um, we're gonna push this element and the type of course is the generic type. If the size is equal equal to the stack, stack length, we're gonna expand the capacity. We go down here and we look at the expand capacity uh, function. <clears throat> Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to make a copy of the stack where we're going to make the length of this thing twice as big as the other one. So again, this is a pretty common strategy. Like I said before, the STL does the same thing in C++. We're going to multiply the current length by two. We're going to double it and we're going to copy the stack into the new stack that we're the new array that we're allocated. We're going to copy the old array into the new array that we're allocating. And we're going to double the size of the array. So if the size is too big, we're going to do that. If it's not, we're going to set the stack top, which is remember, it's the next one we're going to fill. It's the next empty one. We're going to set it to element, and then we're going to plus plus. And the reason we do that again is because that gives us a really nice way to keep count of the to keep count of the uh, track of the count and the stack top at the same time, right? Because if we start at zero, it's always n minus one. We don't like dealing with these n minus ones. This is just a nice little way to do it to keep us from having to hassle with these things too much. Um, all right, so pop. Pop here, if you look at this, throws an empty collection exception, right? So we haven't seen this before, but we mentioned that um, we want to throw exceptions if we abuse the stack itself, not something internal like it ran out of memory, but we want to throw exceptions if we've abused the stack the way that the stack is supposed to work. So if I call pop, and the stack is empty, then I need to throw an empty collection exception and say, that's well, the stack, right? So if this thing is empty, um, and then the is empty function, all it does is check the top to see if it's zero. If it's zero, then the stack is empty, right? Um, so we do a top minus minus, meaning we decrement. So let's say it's not empty. Um, we're gonna decrement the uh, stack, the, the top by one. We're gonna say, the result is equal to the stack top. So we decremented it by one. So the after we decremented, it points to the first one that is um, invalid, right? It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna go from invalid to the first one that's valid. This is actually a reference. And then we're gonna say stack top equals null. Now this is interesting because we don't actually have to do this, right? We're keeping track of where the top is. We don't actually have to set that reference to null necessarily, right? We could just let it go and it would eventually, um, when we replaced it with something else, it would get de deallocated. The worst that would happen was we'd have a, a, dang, a reference to something that's really, really not using anymore, which is really not such a big deal. Um, and, and what would happen is when you when you pop, push something on the, on the top of the stack again, whatever that reference was to would immediately be um, the reference account would be decremented for it, right? So we wouldn't really have a problem with that. And then when we destroyed the stack, it would destroy all the references and it would be fine. Um, but what this does for us, the reason that this is nice for you to do stuff like this is this sets this thing to null. So if you make a mistake somewhere in your code for your stack, the fact that this thing is null, so let's say you don't set it to null, you just leave it like it is, which you can do, it's not a problem, it works. Um, but if you make an error, you could accidentally access something that was in the stack that really wasn't supposed to be in the stack, um, but you just never you never set the reference to it to null, right? So setting that thing to null means that if in one of my functions somewhere, 
I accidentally um, used that reference invalidly, it's going to crash, right? And that helps me debug my code. So when you do something like this and you're working with the data structure and you have a, a reference to something and you're, you're basically throwing it away, but you don't have to because it doesn't really need to be thrown away, you should always just throw it away because this really helps you with your debugging. It helps you find errors in your code because you'll get a no a no reference exception, a no pointer exception, and this thing is going to crash, which is what you want it to do. Otherwise, it'll just keep running and you never know what the hell is going to happen to it. Um, all right, so here's, here's our next function that we're going to implement. It's our peak function. Uh, again, this throws an empty, uh, except, empty collection exception because we assume that the stack isn't empty when you do this. In fact, if you call peak, you should probably check if it is empty first um, before you call peak. So if is empty, we're going to throw this exception. Otherwise, you're going to return stack top minus one. So this is, remember, top is the first empty element. It's going to return the first valid element in the stack, which is the top of the stack. Um, so this is what peak. It's pretty straightforward to implement. Um, all right, so now that we have looked at this, um, I'm going to take a break here. We're going to start on the next video. And thanks, everyone.